Okay, uh, welcome back. Uh, so uh, the uh, schedule for second week has been updated. So here's the updated schedule. I'm not sure if it's the same on the wiki page. If it's not, this is the correct schedule. Um, okay. Um, okay, so uh, we're going to now continue our discussion of the uh, Viersoro conformal block uh, for the uh, four-point function on the plane or the sphere of a 2D CFT. And last time we discussed um, that there is a uh, vowel transformation or conformal mapping from the uh, plane or the sphere with the four punctures to this pillow geometry um, explicitly like so. Um, I'm just copying down the, the formula we wrote uh, on the board uh, from last time. Uh, so let me remind you that um, so the conform block on the plane and uh, up to a vowel anomaly factor. So th here you have some universal factor which depends only on center charge and only on the weight of the external operators. Um, have to do with the vowel transformation you have to, to, to do to go from the plane to the pillow. Uh, then for, uh, the conform block on the pillow can be viewed uh, as uh, some sort of state created by the insertion of these operators, one, two, three, four, uh, created by operator one and two uh, on the bottom of the pillow. And then you, you have a state that propagates along a twisted cylinder, uh, along a cylinder, uh, then with a twist. And then you take the overlap of that with a state created by three and four inserted at the top of the pillow. Um, uh, in writing this conform block, we're only taking the um, propagation uh, over uh, states which are Virasoro descendants of some uh, conformal primary of weight h. Uh, that's this h parameter here. Um, and uh, the, uh, the would-be OP coefficients has been stripped off. And this is only the, the, the holomorphic part. Um, any questions about uh, this relation here? This. OK, so. Um, uh, and the way that this uh, mapping works, uh, so I should write uh, somewhere here, I think. So this will be uh, W equals 0 in the parentization. On the, 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 the pillow, you can think of as there's a, there's a sheet on the front and there's a sheet in the back. Say on the sheet on the front, there's W equals 0, W equals pi, and this W equals uh, pi tau. So uh, if you have a state uh, propagating along the cylinder, um, that um, uh, the, the propagator is going to be q to the uh, uh, q, which is e to the pi i tau. Here, don't, I don't I don't have a factor two because this is pi it's pi tau here, not um, uh, two pi tau, um, because of this z two quotient that goes from the torus to the to the pillow, um, and uh, yeah, that, that's why here you have q to the L0 minus c over 24. Remember, this L0 minus c over 24 is the holomorphic part of the Hamiltonian uh, on the, of the CFT on the cylinder. So uh, more, uh, well, this, uh, this um, pillow conform block, which I denote in this way, uh, you could expand. Um, according to uh, the level of the Viasoro descendants of this weight H primary that propagates along the cylinder, uh, this level you know, by little n, uh, there's, some go there's going to be some coefficient a n, uh, which will depend on the weight, the internal charge, uh, and the internal weight, and which level it is, uh, then q to the uh, H plus n minus c over 24. This is just the L0 eigenvalue of a level n uh, descendant of the weight H primary. Okay. Any questions about this? I haven't uh, told you how to compute a n. Uh, in fact, I won't describe that explicitly now. But last time, I described how, in principle, you will be able to uh, compute the um, conform block on the plane uh, by its definition. Uh, and then there are also these recursion relations uh, by n continuation. The central charge allows you to compute it more efficiently. But I won't dis discuss that in detail. Um, OK. Uh, by the way, uh, and I also described this, uh, the, the sort of the 
geometric picture of how um, the uh, the um, so we have a, a map from uh, the now I call this the U plane to the to the W pillow, um, and uh, the cross ratio, the conformally invariant cross ratio, uh, Z, um, is mapped to this tau parameter, or the Q parameter, which is also known as the elliptic gnome. Um, by by definition, this tau uh, is a complex parameter that lives on the upper half plane. So Q lives in the unit disk. This is the Q disk. Um, and um, on the Z plane, the conformal block as a function uh, of Z, uh, if you uh, strip off some overall factor, o overall power of Z that uh, depends on the external and internal weights, then the rest, as we discussed, is a power series expansion involving uh, non-negative integer powers of Z. Uh, and that uh, a priori has a radius convergence, which is 1. Um, and the conformal block, then, as a function of z, has a branch cut from 1 to infinity. Um, uh, on the other hand, the, um, uh, the, as an analytic function in z, the conformal block can be analytically continued to the entire uh, z plane. Uh, and the entire z plane, under this elliptic gnome, gets mapped to this uh, some kind of i-shaped domain uh, on the unit disk um, if you so the the, the top the, the the boundary of the the the, 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 uh, the line just above and below the branch cut are mapped to the the top and lower uh, and the bottom boundary of the um, i shaped domain and over here as a uh, function of Q as a series expansion in Q um, uh, the conform blocks is in fact uh, Convergent on the entire Q disk, and you can only continue uh, to from the inside this I-shaped region to to the entire unit Q disk um, on the Z plane that corresponds to any continuing uh, across the the branch cut to other sheets. Any questions about this? Uh, how do you see the convergence? Uh, so let's see. Um, let's consider a uh, let's consider an example. So uh, s s say you take uh, uh, well, okay. <laughs> First of all, you know, uh, intuitively, uh, it has to be convergent because we're talking about the overlap between the states created by one, two, and the state created, created by three, four, uh, by propagation Euclidean time. So, so it's convergent for any positive uh, uh, Euclidean time. Yes. Um, and that, that's the basic reason. Uh, but in fact, we can say even even more. Um, so uh, if you if you take uh, one two three four if you take three to be the same as two one four so if, if you take the weight of because this thing only cares about the weight of the external uh, operator and as well as the internal uh, primary so if you take h three to be equal to h two h four to be equal to, equal to h one um, then uh, the state created by three and four is the just the conjugate of the state created by one two um, so in that case. Um, if you take Q to be, if you take Q to be um, uh, real uh, between zero and one, uh, then uh, in fact uh, here you're just uh, uh, up to this propagator, you're just computing the norm, the inner product of the state with itself, uh, which is um, uh, which is positive, uh, and in fact uh, every term in this Q expansion will be positive because you're just taking the overlap between uh, some descendants, the state created by, by this and, and the state created cre cre by that. Um, and uh, so, uh, in this case, uh, in particular, uh, all the coefficients a n uh, would be non-negative, and uh, zero only if you have some null state. Okay. Uh, so, and uh, in that case, you know, in particular, the the, the series is supposed to uh, converge uh, for a real positive q up to one, and uh, therefore it converges on the entire unit q. This by this some inequality you can write down. Um, okay. Um, so in this, uh, well, so a n uh, is non negative in this case. <coughs> um, okay, let's see. Uh, 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 but by the way, uh, uh, just to say one more thing, 
if you explicitly write Q as an expansion in Z, so uh, if Z is near zero, uh, then uh, uh, Q is also close to zero. Uh, and a precise relation, well, you can write an expansion of Q near equal to zero. It turns out to look like Z over 16 plus Z squared over 32 plus uh, da da da. So next thing one Z cubed over okay, plus da da da. Um, okay. Um, so, uh, and uh, one more property uh, I will mention of this uh, uh, pillow conform block uh, is that uh, uh, this expression simplifies in the large internal weight limit. I won't really need this um, uh, for much of the discussion, but uh, it's a useful way to to guide your uh, uh, to help your understanding of uh, the convergence of the conform block expan uh, of the of conform block expansion or the OPE. Okay, so uh, it, it turns out that in the limits, when the internal weight is, is large, this expression becomes very simple. You can just write this very explicit formula. Um, uh, so this factor of Q to the H minus C over 24, that's always there. That comes you know, for, for any of this conform block. That's easy to understand. Um, uh, up to some overall normalization, the remaining, this factor is infinite product. Uh, there's kind of some kind of heuristic way to understand this, which is that, um, uh, uh, w w which is the following. So, so we said that this this pillow is uh, sort of uh, a Z two quotient of a torus, um, and uh, where these corners are uh, fixed points of the Z two. Um, now, uh, if you imagine that uh, you have a CFT on the on the torus, and um, you can uh, you know, if you fold the torus onto, onto yourself, you have sort of two copies of CFT leave on the pillow. Uh, but if, if you go around each of these corners, you travel from one copy of CFT to the other copy of, C of the CFT. Okay, so in that case, um, from that perspective, uh, we can think of the CFT on the torus as uh, the CFT on the pillow, uh, two copies of the tensor, the tensor product of two copies of the same CFT on the pillow. Uh, with some kind of operator inserted at the corners, such that if you go around this operator, you go from one copy of CFT to, to another. Uh, this is an example of what we call uh, a twist field. Um, and we'll discuss, uh, it, it'll be a special case of a more general construction called orbifold, which we'll come to maybe at the beginning of the next lecture. Um, uh, so uh, uh, now, uh, it, the, the idea is that in this, for this pillow conformal block in the limit where the internal weight is large, um, this insertion of the twist field is somehow um, not important for the fixed external operators. Um, and you can uh, view this uh, conform block on the pillow as uh, sort of half of the propagation of, uh, of the one copy of CFT on the entire uh, torus. And if you uh, take this expression and with this one half, power, power minus one half here, if you take this expression and square it, what you get is the virasoral character of the vacuum uh, uh, on the on the torus, which uh, uh, is uh, sort of the sum over all the virasoral descendants of a um, say of of, a, of of some primary that propagates along the entire torus. Uh, that's probably not a very uh, illuminating uh, 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 explanation because I think I, I we need to actually invoke a few notions with, that will only be uh, introduced later, but. Uh, Anyway, the point is, is to say that there's some intuition behind, behind this formula for the large H limit. Um, now, uh, 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 given this, we can uh, uh, understand uh, the convergence property of the uh, conform block expansion of the four-point four function. So uh, we said that uh, the, 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 the four-point function of uh, um, the actual operators, some, uh, say, phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, phi 4, inserted at 0, z, uh, 1, and infinity, this one with the appropriate rescaling, um, can be written as the conform block expansion. Uh, uh, actually, let me write this in the, as the same sort of vile uh, anomaly factor, uh, 
which is written at the leftmost blackboard, um, times uh, the um, four point function on the pillow, uh, which can be now written as a conform block decomposition. So, so previously, uh, I was just writing the conform block. Now we're writing the actual correlation function, uh, which involves some uh, C one two K. Uh, so actually, for for the purpose now, let, let me discuss the the special case where I take three to be equal to two uh, and four to be equal to one, just for the convenience of the discussion. So I get C one two K squared um, psi one two. Uh, Q of zero and the C over twenty-four uh, psi one two. Um, this notation is a bit ambiguous because I have to say that uh, I take the conform block where I, you know, the, where the internal um, uh, states are very short descendants of some uh, uh, of some primary of weight uh, H K. So uh, let me put the index K up here. Just to indicate that we're talking talking about the state created by set, uh, one and two, and project onto the H K sector, um, and then multiply by the anti-holomorphic counterpart Q bar L zero bar minus C tilde over twenty four psi one two tilde K, um, and uh, as we said in this case, uh, each of this uh, takes the form of some expansion like that, where a n are uh, non-negative coefficients. Okay. So, um, um, and furthermore, uh, we so you can you can you can now ask you know how does this thing uh, converge at um, uh, how does you, you, how does this sum converge at some given value of q? So that's now easy to understand because. Uh, here I've told you explicitly the large internal weight limit of these conform blocks. So up to some uh, factors independent of the weight, you have basically q to the h or 16 q to the h. Uh, so so this thing. So for the large internal weight h k, if h k and h k tilde are much bigger than one, then the, these factors, the, these factors go like 16 q to the h uh, uh, k 16. Q bar to the H K tilde, um, and so uh, in particular, if Q is real between zero and one, so these things just go like sixteen Q to the H K plus H K tilde, um, and uh, this sum has to be uh, convergent for uh, Q between zero and one that correspond to uh, Z between zero and one. That the the, the four point function is supposed to be analytic as a function of Z and Z bar in that range. Um, so the sum better converge for Q up to one, uh, and uh, then by Cauchy-Schwarz identity, you can uh, see that uh, if the sum converges for real Q up to one, then for any uh, Q within in the interior of the unit disk of modulus less than one, the sum converges um, exponentially. Okay, so the uh, the upshot here is that uh, if you organize the uh, conform block expansion. Um, of the four-point function uh, in this way, as expansion in Q, then in the interior of the Q disk, the, um, uh, the expansion converges exponentially fast. Um, it also tells you a precise sense in which uh, the upper product, product expansion converges, because this is basically, uh, you know, you take the OP of phi one with phi two and OP of phi one with phi two, and this is some kind of um, uh, well, it's, it's the overlap of the OP of phi one and phi two with another OP of phi one and phi two. Um, any questions about this? Yes. Yeah. Uh, that's correct. Uh, well, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it corresponds to uh, the uh, oh. Uh, so at the level of the conformal block, uh, it's just the each conformal block that corresponds to any continuation of uh, uh, the z uh, across the branch cut. The level of the four-point function, of course, um, there is no there is no branch cut. The four-point function is supposed to be single-valued, but it's a function of z and z bar. Uh, uh, but if you and continue z and z bar independently, then you will again have some branch cuts, and you get to some something else. Uh, I don't know if 
I don't know if Tom is going to discuss some related things, but uh, it's, for example, uh, it's the, the continuation of the four point function to Lorentzian signature is, um, is related to such a continuation of z and z bar, z bar independently. Okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, yeah, very good. Um, let's see. Uh, so uh, uh, now, uh, uh, earlier we said that one of the uh, essential uh, consistent condition of a 2D CFT is the associativity of the OPE, which is equivalent to this crossing equation uh, for the sphere four-point function. That is to say, uh, if you have the, this four-point function on the sphere or on the plane, uh, if you do the OP of you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, if you do, do the OP of 1, 2, and OP of 3, 4, and then take their overlap, which is what we're doing here, uh, this should be equal to, uh, if you take the OP of 2, 3 first, and then with the OP of 1, 1 4, and take their overlap. Um, and in terms of the uh, uh, actual formula of the formula function in terms of the um, conformal block expansion, uh, just to just write this down, just to be to, to be precise, um, the OP uh, so we have this uh, uh, OP coefficients, which are the structure constants, uh, the conformal block uh, H1, H2, H3, H4, this function of the cross ratio Z, uh, and uh, the anti-holomorphic guy with the the tilde variables. Sorry, this also depends on HK. Uh, Z bar uh, would be equal to the same expression uh, with uh, uh, the row of some of these uh, indices exchanged. So this will be C14K, C23K, uh, FC H3, H2, H4, H5, H6, H7, H8, H9, H10, H11, H12, H13, H14, H15, H16, H17, H18, H19, H20, H21, H22, H23, H24, H25, H26, H27, H27, H28, H29, H30, H31, H32, H33, H34, H35, H36, H37, H38, H39, H40, H41, H42, H43, H44, H45, H46, H47, H48, H49, H50, H51, H52, H53, H54, H55, H56, H57, 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 H
so we can uh, put the coordinate z here. So this is uh, 0, 2 pi, uh, 2 pi tau. So z is supposed to be the coordinate parameterized notorious, which is identified with z plus 2 pi, with z plus 2 pi tau. Um, so tau is the complex modulus of the torus. Um, now uh, we can, so this picture, for example, could correspond to uh, cutting along uh, this cycle here. So this is, so let me represent the torus in such a way that uh, this, this, this line here with the two ends identified is this cycle where I want to cut along that and insert complete basic states. Uh, so what I have here is um, the Hilbert space, so the, the, the set of states inserted here are the states in the Hilbert space of the CFT on a circle or on a cylinder, and then I propagate along cylinder and then act on it with operator O, as an inserted at some point, and then uh, take the overlap with the state itself. Um, so that's supposed to be uh, equivalent uh, to um, uh, uh, the same picture, uh, but now I uh, cut along this cycle here. Uh, now this picture is uh, a bit hard to see, so let's rotate it a little bit. So this is supposed to uh, become something like this, I guess, uh, with the O inserted here. Uh, uh, so that now this two picture looks uh, a bit similar, except that uh, I've first I have to do a, do some uh, uh, appropriate rotation um, of this picture, and also the the uh, this the, the the length here is um, uh, is not uh, is not quite two pi right? because the, the the length of this edge is not quite two pi. So I have to do rotation and then perform rescaling, so, uh, both of which are of course conformal transformation. So after doing this conformal transformation, I can put this back to um, two pi, uh, but uh, this uh, thing this point here now becomes minus two pi over tau. Okay, so there's some uh, conformal transformation involved here. Um, uh, now, uh, if O is the operator of definite uh, uh, conformal weight H and H tilde, actually, for this purpose here, I don't even need O to be a primary. I, ju I just need to have definite conformal weights because uh, all the conformal transformations involved here is a dilatation and a rotation. Um, so any operator with definite conformal weights are transforming in a very simple way under that. Um, so uh, if you actually work out that conformal transformation, uh, you find the following relation. Uh, so the one-point function of the operator O uh, on the torus uh, with modulus tau, I use this notation. Um, uh, uh, so if you do this conformal transformation, you're supposed to get the torus with the modulus uh, minus 1 over tau. Um, this would be equal to O uh, on the torus with modulus tau uh, multiplied um, by uh, some factor which has to do with the, uh, how the O operator O itself transform under conformal transformation. and um, uh, that factor can be written as uh, basically involves some power of tau to the, uh, let's say, h. So this operator O has weight h, uh, h tilde. This involves uh, uh, tau to the uh, h tau bar uh, to the h tilde. Um, uh, this expression um, it, it's, it's basically this, this conformal weight factor, the, 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 the factor you get by doing conformal transformation of O is basically this, except that uh, uh, tau is defined on, on the upper half plane. So usually, if you want to specify unambiguously um, this tau to some power uh, h, which is not an integer, um, so uh, if you want to specify the, the, the choice of branch, we put minus i tau here so that this minus i tau has positive uh, real part. Uh, and the choice of branch is unambiguous, i tau bar, and then we put the factor e to the pi i over 2, uh, h uh, minus h tilde. Uh, so that would be uh, the um, uh, this uh, 
uh, crossing equation for the one point function on, on the torus. Um, and uh, so the one point function on the torus uh, can be uh, decomposed again in terms of um, uh, very short conformal blocks, but now uh, these are conformal blocks on the torus. That is, uh, I can think of having one operator, O, inserted, and I have some state that propagates along the torus. Um, so I have a state over here. It kind of propagates around the torus. And then uh, I take the uh, uh, O acting on the state and take its overlap with another state. This up conformal transformation is, once again, a three-point function. It's a three-point function between uh, O and uh, a pair of general very short descendants of the same prime, of, of some other primary. Um, so I can represent that uh, a conformal block by uh, this picture. So I have some state that propagates along on the torus. This is a state on the circle. And it comes back and takes its three-point function with O. Um, uh, more explicitly, uh, we can uh, write this as sum of um, uh, 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 let's see, uh, let's see. I, I, let's see. sum over some state labeled by labeled by the index K. Um, C, uh, I guess I write O, K, K. Uh, maybe in this case, let me write this O to represent this by some primary, phi i, for the purpose of writing this graph equation. So C, I, K, K. Uh, they have some uh, torus one point conformal block, uh, which I'll denote by curly G, depending on the center charge, depending on the uh, weight H, I uh, of the external operator, this is I. And depends on which weight HK of the internal operator, um, and depends on the modulus tau, uh, which is the only parameter uh, here, because as I said, the position of the operator O does not matter by translation invariance. Um, and then I have G bar C tilde, uh, HI tilde, HK tilde uh, tau bar. Uh, so what is this torus one point conformal block? Well, I describe it in words, but uh, we can turn this into a formula, of course, um, e to the minus 2 pi i tau c over 24. This is sort of the ground state energy in the, for the Hamiltonian on the cylinder, which is the holomorphic part. Uh, and then we have sum over descendants um, n and n, which uh, are integer partici partitions as before, at the same level. Uh, the in inverse gram matrix g n m uh, depends on center charge, depends on internal weight h k. Uh, and then we have this three-point function, rho uh, of descendants uh, of some fictitious uh, primary uh, that we described before in the case of the uh, sphere four-point conform block, L, curly L minus M nu k nu i, and curly L minus n nu k. All right, so hopefully this uh, full formula, the meaning of this formula is uh, evident. In the case of uh, uh, the sphere, four-point conformal block, we have these rows, but uh, uh, three things, but two of those are primaries. One of them is a descendant. Here, two of these are descendants. It's because you have, but both of these are descendants, and you kind of sew them together uh, as they propagate along the torus. Any questions about this? So uh, now, in principle, you know enough to um, put this on the computer, it can calculate all these inverse gram matrix and all these three-point functions and uh, uh, derive your own uh, towards one point class equation. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, uh, indeed. Uh, I must have notes. So, so Q, uh, yeah, the, sorry. Uh, right here. Uh, e to the 2 pi i tau, uh, and this will be h. Uh, K plus uh, uh, the level. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Um, so um, uh, these two equations. Uh, so here, the one, two, three, four are supposed to be understood to range through all possible combination of four uh, primaries of your CFT. And then this equation, uh, uh, this thing combined with this top equation with the O replaced by phi i for every primary phi i. Um, so these are, so far, the complete set of consistent conditions of a 2D conformal field theory. And if you 
uh, classify the solution to these equations, you should discover all 2D common field theories to the extent uh, we know them. Um, but these equations are quite complicated because these, these objects, these conform blocks, are quite complicated objects. Um, so uh, now we'll, we're going to discuss uh, the solution to these um, consistency conditions in, um, uh, in the simplest non-trivial uh, 2D conform field theory, which is uh, uh, one of the minimal models, also known as the Ising CFT. So uh, this is the C plus 1 half. Uh, so, so now we're going to discuss the 2D Ising CFT. Uh, this is one of the, the series of minimal models, so-called. It has central charge uh, 1 half. This is uh, the smallest uh, non-zero central charge that is compatible with unitarity. Uh, with the unitary representations of the Verisor algebra, as I mentioned um, in the first lecture. Um, and uh, there, I also mentioned that uh, the, uh, the pot allowed, uh, so if the CFT is unitary, the, uh, if the central charge equals to one half, uh, the possible primaries, their left or right or holomorphic, and the holomorphic weights, has to be uh, one of these discrete set of values, HRS, where the state admit a null descendant. I didn't explain to you exactly why that is the case, but that is a result of analyzing uh, uh, the unitary representations um, of the Verisor algebra. Um, uh, so uh, here, uh, let me uh, first uh, tell you the actual allowed weights of the operators in the CFT, and we'll study their coordinate functions uh, and, and, and verify that they are indeed consistent. We will not actually try to uh, I'm not going to try to show you uh, in, in entire rigor that these are the, this is the only solution to the consistent conditions at this value of center charge, uh, but that does turn out to be the case. Um, so uh, uh, in this theory, there are three uh, primary, there are several primaries. Uh, now, uh, by the way, I, I should... Uh, you, you should not have the impression that uh, a general CFT would have finally many Verisor primaries. That's generally not true. It's only true for these uh, minimal models. They have finally many Verisor primaries. So there are three Verisor primaries. Um, uh, these three operators, I'll denote them by uh, one of them is one, is identity operator. You always have that. Um, uh, there's a uh, operator sigma, usually called a spin field, or a spin operator. Uh, and then there's the N, so-called energy operator is just the name for now. Uh, I'll denote by epsilon. Uh, so, um, so these have uh, a conformal weight. So let's see. Uh, the, the holomorphic and anti-holomorphic conformal weights, H and H tilde, um, in this case are both equal to HRS for R and S equal to 1. And if you go back and look at the formula I wrote, for R and S both equal to 1, this is equal to 0, uh, of course, as it should, because then the operator has weight 0. Um, the spin field has weight h, h tilde, which is h1, uh, 2. Uh, and if you plug into the formula, it turns out to be 1 over 16. Uh, and the energy operator uh, h, h tilde are also the same, uh, which are equal to h21, that is uh, 1 half. Uh, now let me just emphasize again that in a general CFT, uh, h, uh, for the local operators, the holomorphic weight h and anti-holomorphic weight h tilde generally are not, do not have to be equal, but the difference of them has to be uh, integer, which is the spin. And that's a, a consequence of, um, uh, uh, in fact, it's a consequence of a, uh, um, actually, I, I guess I actually forgot to write that uh, consistent condition. It's uh, the, 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 the one condition, I guess, that was actually missing on the board uh, was uh, that for every operator, uh, the difference between h and h tilde is, is integer. It's, uh, it's equivalent to the modular invariance of the torus partition function under tau goes to tau plus 1. It's, it's kind of an easy condition to check, so I didn't actually write it. Uh, but uh, in the case of the 2D icing CFT, uh, it happens that all the three Verisor primaries um, have uh, equal holomorphic and anti-holomorphic weights. So uh, as an operator, they are scalar operators, have no spin. Um, so, uh, any, uh, any questions so far? Um, uh, so, now, uh, let us analyze uh, the, point the full point function of, well, the identity operator is kind of trivial. If you insert the identity operator, it does nothing. So, let's consider the full point function 
of, um, uh, say, the spin field. Um, so let's consider uh, sigma 0, uh, sigma z, z bar, sigma 1, sigma prime at infinity. Uh, I'm going to write this as, I'll call, I'll call this function f and z, z bar, and our goal is to determine this function f and z of z and z bar. Um, now, uh, if you actually write down the crossing equation, well, in this case, uh, well, if you, if you try to write on the crossing equation, you, you might wonder how am I going to explicitly compute the conformal logs that's going to be involved here. Um, in this particular example, uh, the conformal block, in fact, uh, uh, simplifies thanks to um, a null state relation. So uh, we said before that um, each one of these operators has, uh, 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 has some uh, null states among their virtual descendants. That's not generally the case for a general primary and a general 2D CFT, but is the case in, um, uh, in this example. Uh, so uh, you can detect these null states by computing explicitly the norm of a descendant, of the Virasoro descendants of one of these primaries uh, using the Virasoro algebra, um, uh, and uh, which was also captured by the cast determinant, uh, as I wrote before. Um, so uh, you find that uh, sigma has a null state, a null descendant uh, at level two. Uh, that is, um, if you take the state, uh, the primary state sigma, um, uh, at level two you have two virtual descendants, l minus one squared acting on sigma, and l minus two sigma. Uh, and you'll find that there's a one-linear combination of these two states that has zero norm, and th therefore the theory is, CFT is unitary, um, that linear combination must be zero. Uh, and uh, explicitly, this linear combination is um, L minus 1 squared minus 3 fourth L minus 2 uh, acting on sigma. Uh, I, I, let me use the cat notation. So this will be supposed to be equal to zero. Uh, this is just a consequence of the weight of sigma, which is 1 over 16. So it's the same for the holomorphic and anti-holomorphic sector. So this, you take L bar squared minus 3 quarters, L minus 2 bar, that also annihilates the state sigma. OK, so you have these uh, null states in the holomorphic and anti-holomorphic sector, the descendants of sigma. Um, so uh, uh, this now uh, will constrain the four-point function. Uh, because uh, uh, the fact that the, this particular uh, Virasoro descendants of the speed field uh, is zero in the icing CFT uh, means that if you insert uh, the operator, this combination acting on sigma, into any coordinate function, that coordinate function mu must also vanish. So in particular, um, if, you, uh, if you take that four-point function up there, and uh, replace sigma at z by this null state, uh, then the four-point function will have to be zero. So in particular, uh, this guy, you know, sigma uh, at z, z bar, uh, sigma one, sigma prime, infinity. So this has to be equal to zero. Uh, let's unpackage this a little bit. So uh, before, if you have, if you have L2, acting on some operator at the origin, uh, we would write this as this contour integral um, by our definition of um, um, uh, z. Uh, uh, so it would be uh, uh, z to the n plus 1 for ln acting on the times the stress energy tensor. So here n is minus 2. So this is uh, 1 over z, let's say 1 over z. I can find a 0. Uh, now, if you let me change this to W actually. Uh, so this is still at zero. Um, now, if you apply this to an operator inserted at z, uh, you have to replace this W by W minus z. I can find z. Okay, so this is L two L sorry L minus two 
the rare sort generator acting on this operator at z can be written in this way, where this contour now is along a uh, counterclockwise contour that surrounds the point z. Uh, but no, it encloses only z, but no other op operators. Um, so uh, to draw a picture, we have uh, sigma at 0, sigma at 1, and sigma at z, z bar, but we have this uh, counter integral around it. Actually, for this L minus 1 squared, you have to do this counter integral twice. Uh, but in fact, in this case, we don't have to do that explicitly because L minus 1 acting on sigma is the same as taking the holomorphic derivative with back to z on sigma. Um, and then you have uh, sigma uh, at, sorry, at infinity. OK, so uh, now um, uh, the strategy now is to uh, re-express this um, full point function in terms of the uh, formal function of the primaries. And we mentioned before that we can always do this uh, by the Virasura word identity, which can be derived by deforming these contours. So, so for example, I can trade that uh, uh, counterclockwise contour uh, around z to the sum of three clock clockwise contour around these other points. So I, I turn this contour into these other three. They're the same thing. Um, and then I can shrink this contour on sigma 0, this contour around sig sigma 1, and that contour I deform to infinity. Okay, so now what is the consequence of this? Uh, so uh, this, the integrand, for example, for this L minus 2 part, uh, the integrand of that uh, contour integral is Tw over W minus Z. Um, this factor multiplying Tw uh, it was singular at z, at w equals z, but it's not singular at w equals 0 or w equals 1. It's uh, entirely holomorphic. So this contour, if you crush this contour onto a sigma 0, you're just going to pick out the singular terms in the t sigma OPE, which you already know, because sigma is a primary of a known weight. Uh, likewise, you can crush this over here, and you can, you, you can move this, this other contour to infinity. That's what it means to, to shrink that contour to infinity. Um, OK. so. Uh, uh, so all of that can be uh, uh, worked out quite explicitly, uh, and uh, uh, so l let me just write some explicit formula to 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 help understanding the, what's going on here. Um, uh, in a w just like, uh, as in the way we, did, we wrote the expansion of the Virasoro conform block, this full point function can be represented as the overlap uh, between, uh, the, as a matrix ele element between a state sigma uh, created by sigma at 0 with this other ket state created by sigma prime at infinity with the insertion of uh, sigma 1 and sigma as z, z bar. Uh, but now let's consider acting on this sigma with L minus 2. Um, so this, as we said, is the same as the contour integral Cz, uh, 1 over W minus Z, uh, sigma, sigma 1, Tw, sigma Z, sigma, ket. Um, and uh, by doing this contour deformation, uh, it's uh, not hard to uh, verify uh, by looking at the, uh, the Laurent expansion of Tw around infinity uh, that this, uh, uh, the, the part of this contour that kind of shrinks to infinity um, or expands to infinity uh, will have no contribution. This has to do with the fact that sigma uh, at infinity itself is a primary. Um, and uh, then you're left with the contribution from shrinking this contour to uh, 0 and 1, respectively. Um, and from those OPE, you pick up something that involves the weight of the operator H12, uh, 1 over z squared. This comes from the leading singular term in the OPE of t with sigma at 0, uh, plus 1 over 1 minus z squared, uh, multiplying the full point function of just the primaries that's left behind. Um, and then there's a term uh, that involves a derivative uh, of the operator uh, as zero, 
Uh, and then there's a term that involves uh, the derivative of the operator sigma at 1. That comes from the 1 over uh, the one over w minus uh, the one over w singularity, or one over w minus one singularity in the OP of t with sigma at zero and sigma at one. Uh, so that's it. And as I said before, uh, the l minus one square here just act on sigma as a double derivative. Okay, so. Uh, uh, now, uh, the, the, these two objects at the bottom here are, are not quite uh, the full-point functional primaries, but you can easily re rewrite them, re-express them in terms of the full-point functional primaries. Um, you can do that by uh, restoring uh, the. Um, you can do that by restoring the. Uh, the general form of the four-point function as a function of the four generic coordinates. Uh, in fact, for, for this purpose here, uh, it, it suffices to kind of restore the uh, dependence on three of the coordinates. So sigma z1, z1 bar, sigma z2, z2 bar, sigma 3, z3, z3 bar, uh, as we said before, you can use some uh, PSL2C trans transformation to move, uh, say, z1 to 0 and z3 to 1, z to z. Um, and if you do that, you can relate to this to the full point function f, which is the, uh, the function f, which is the function of the cross ratio in the following way. So in this case, the cross ratio is, so what we'll plays the role of z is z to 1 over z3 1 and z to 1 bar over z3 1 bar. And the coefficient here is 1 over mod z31 to the power 4 h12, because both the uh, holomorphic and anti-holomorphic weights of these operators are h12. So this you can uh, check for yourself with, by applying some uh, appropriate uh, PSL2C transformation. Um, so, so once you have this uh, general formula, you can uh, then, of course, uh, easily take the derivative of the formula on z1 uh, and, or to take a derivative on z3 and then bring the z1 to 0 and z3 to 1 and you get uh, these correlators that's needed at the bottom. Okay, so uh, all of that would be uh, some uh, straightforward, simple uh, uh, algebraic uh, exercise and uh, at the end of the day, uh, you'll find that uh, this equation uh, here, star, uh, can be written as a second order differential equation for the function uh, f, z, and z bar. Uh, that takes the form partial z squared. Remember the partial z squared come from the l minus 1 squared. Um, then plus some uh, uh, stuff, which can be written as 3 times minus 2z. OK, so there's some non-trivial second order differential equation like this. OK, so uh, this is a, uh, can be uh, turned into a uh, um, hypergeometric equation. In this case, it happens to have a solution that can be written in terms of elementary functions. Um, so uh, well, you can plug this into Mathematica and find that there are two, uh, of course, there should be two linearly independent solutions, uh, which are called um, denoted by f plus minus. Uh, explicitly, they are uh, square root of 1 plus minus square root of z over z to the 1 eighth, uh, 1 minus z to the 1 eighth. Uh, we'll, we'll come to that in, in, uh, in a second. S sorry, I, I mean here, I'm talking about uh, two uh, linearly independent solutions of this holomorphic differential equation. Okay, so, so fzz bar will be expressed as the convention of, uh, of these two functions, whose coefficient will depend on z bar. We'll, we'll, we'll come to that uh, uh, in, in a second. So maybe I should run an arrow. So the uh, uh, two uh, linearly uh, independent uh, solutions are f plus and f minus. Uh, 
okay, so uh, let me recap. The only information that we have put in so far is um, the weight of sigma, which enters the world identity, uh, virtual world identity here, the H12, which is 1 over 16, and that there's a null, null state. It's a null design like, like of that form. Okay, so uh, uh, the conformal block that would appear in the um, uh, conformal block decomposition of this four-point function corresponds to some particular channel in the sigma sigma OPE, uh, then has to be a linear combination of F plus and F minus. Okay, so, uh, but which conform block are we talking about? So, uh, if, as I claimed, the, there exists such a CFT with only three primaries, uh, then the sigma sigma OPE uh, has to contain virtual descendants of one of the three primaries, one sigma and epsilon. <coughs> uh, so if that were the case, uh, you might expect to have three uh, different conform blocks, but there are only two uh, nearly independent functions that can appear here. Uh, which actually means that only two uh, out of the three operators can appear in the sigma sigma OP. That's just a consequence of the Virasoro symmetry. <coughs> um, okay, so uh, so which conform block appears? Uh, well, this can be easily seen by simply expanding this function uh, in the power series of z, and just to see what powers appear, because uh, the powers are dictated by the um, dimension of the, or the weight of the primaries that appear. Um, in the intermediate channel. Um, so uh, in fact, so if we expand uh, around uh, z equals 0, uh, then we can do that expansion. Uh, so then you'll find that there's a linear combination f plus z plus f minus z over 2. So this combination has a nice expansion. It looks like z to the uh, minus 1 eighth, uh, 1 plus z squared over 64 uh, plus z cubed over 64 plus da da da. Uh, and then there's another combination. You take f plus z uh, minus f minus of z. <coughs> so this uh, is equal to uh, z to the uh, 3 eighth, uh, 1 plus z over 4 plus uh, 9 over 64 z squared plus da da da. Okay, so uh, <coughs> uh, each of this will then uh, be a candidate conformal block uh, because it takes the form of z to some generally some non integer power multiplied by some series expansion involving only integer powers of z. Uh, so this turned out to be, uh, I'll denote this by f0 and denote this by f of 1 half. Uh, I guess the, my notation is slightly different from before. Before I wrote the subscript as a center charge, here I'm writing a subscript for the intermediate weight. So this corresponds to a conformal block with intermediate primary having weight 0. This minus 1 eighth coming from this 1 eighth is the sum of one, one, 1 over 16 and 1 over 16 from the two external operators. Um, this power here is minus 1 eighth plus a half. It corresponds to the propagation uh, of the conformal block that corresponds to the propagation of descendants of a weight 1 half operator. So this um, so in other words, in terms of the picture, this corresponds to the uh, conformal block of uh, sigma, sigma. Uh, well, maybe I should just write uh, the weight, 116, 116, 116, 116, and the intermediate uh, primary has weight 0. This one corresponds to the conformal block where the intermediate uh, primary has weight 1 half. Um, if you uh, actually use the defi definition of the conform block in terms of this expansion with the inverse grand matrix and all the three-point function descendants and so on and so forth, you can try to directly verify that formula uh, uh, or a few terms of this expansion. That would be a very nice exercise, but here you can solve the entire expansion using the null state equation. Uh, any questions so far? Yes? So if I want to compute these conform blocks directly by inserting the intermediate states, I still need to do an infinite sum even though there's a null state. Uh, 
That, that, that's, I mean, uh, uh, sure, I mean, this expansion continues forever. Yes? Ah, uh, sorry. The, 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 the question is uh, whether you still have to do an infinite sum based on the definition of the uh, uh, sum over the descendants. The answer is yes. And also, you have to take care of the null states, which is a bit subtle, because if you just naively invert the full grand matrix, of course, that matrix has uh, zero eigenvalues. So you cannot just invert the grand matrix. You have to remove the null states by hand. So, so that would be. Uh, I'm, uh, uh, well, in this case, you know, well, in principle, you know what the null states are, um, uh, but I'm not sure if, uh, if I know any kind of simple way of uh, writing uh, just a, some kind of basis that the automatic excludes the null states. I'm not aware of uh, a simple way to do that. Yeah, OK. <coughs> um, all right. Uh, now, the, the same story for the anti-holomorphic sector. Of course, you can write the anti-holomorphic conform block, which are, the, um, which are f0 of z bar and f1 half of z bar. Um, so um, uh, given that, the four-point function <coughs> uh, Uh, so now we have the explicit expression for these conformal blocks. Uh, uh, the four-point function f z z bar of the spin field uh, should uh, admit uh, the conformal block expansion, which in this case is just a finite sum um, that corresponds to uh, you know, the possible operators that, that, that appear, whose dimension uh, appear, whose uh, holomorphic and anti-holomorphic weights appear in those conformal blocks. Um, so what we can have is the identity channel, which involves f0z and f0z uh, uh, bar. Um, uh, in a priori, there's some OP coefficient here. Um, but if we're talking about the identity operator, the weight 0, uh, then uh, uh, we can, for this, so in terms of operator, we have identity channel. So the OP coefficients, which is the three-point function of identity with sigma and sigma is just a two-point function of sigma with sigma. Um, and by convention, we'll normalize that two-point function to 1. Uh, then there's the coefficient here is just equal to 1. Um, and uh, for the, uh, the uh, another intermediate operator that, that can appear is the epsilon channel, because epsilon, the energy operator, has weight uh, 1 half comma 1 half. Uh, that matches this f1 half that, that's allowed here. So we have f1 half of z, f1 half of z bar. Uh, uh, and now we have some uh, OP coefficient c sigma sigma epsilon uh, squared. Um, we, we, a priori, we don't know what this OP coefficient is. Um, but we know that uh, it's supposed to be a real number in the unitary CFT, and here the square of that appears in this function. Um, now, uh, we can, in fact, uh, fix this OP coefficient, C sigma sigma epsilon, uh, by demanding that the function f and z, z bar, a, a single value of the function of z and z bar, and obey the, uh, the crossing equation. Um, so uh, for instance, um, um, Uh, under uh, z goes to minus 1 over z, uh, the crossing equation says that under z goes to minus, z goes to 1 minus z, and z bar goes to 1 minus uh, z bar, this function f and z, z, z bar, uh, should come back to itself. Um, now, uh, if you, uh, uh, so if you just write this formula, of f plus and f minus, uh, there's some ambiguity in the choice of branch cuts. We should, uh, uh, by our convention here, we're always going to work with the convention that the branch cut of this conformal block is, uh, uh, is going to run from uh, 1 to infinity, from z equals 1 to, to infinity. Um, that will unambiguously specify that analytic function on the plane, on the complex plane with this cut. Um, and uh, with that convention, uh, f plus of 1 minus z and f minus of 
1 minus z, you can, in fact, verify it's not immediately evident uh, from this form, but, but you can you know, plug in and check that, in fact, if you replace z by 1 minus z, of course, um, the denominator uh, is invariant under z equals to 1 minus z, but the uh, numerator, if you take z to 1 minus z, that becomes something else. Uh, but you can actually verify that magically they turn to the combination of f plus and f minus again. So this tur turned out to be equal to f plus of z uh, plus f minus of z over square root 2. And this is equal to f plus of z minus f minus of z over square root 2. I will invite you to verify that for yourself. It's a high school, high school level exercise. Uh, and um, so uh, then uh, you'll find that if you plug this in, uh, f of 1 minus z, 1 minus z bar, uh, would be equal to uh, 1 over square 2 f 0 um, uh, plus of z plus 1 over 2 square root 2 f 1 half of z uh, mod squared. Here, here I'm using a notation where I think of z bar as a complex conjugate of z, which is true for uh, Euclidean four-point function, um, plus c sigma sigma epsilon squared square root of 2 f0 of z minus 1 over square root 2 uh, f 1 half of z squared. Okay? Uh, but uh, the crossing equation says that uh, these two things ha has to be equal. This is the crossing equation. Um, and then if you expand this out, you see that the only way these uh, two things are equal is if the cross term uh, cancel and uh, these coefficients combine into one and these coefficients combine in, in this way. Um, and uh, uh, and miraculously, uh, miraculously that, uh, that is indeed possible um, with uh, C sigma sigma epsilon uh, be equal to uh, plus minus a half. Uh, the sign doesn't actually matter because um, we can absorb this sign into a, uh, by a redefinition of epsilon. We can replace uh, epsilon by minus epsilon, uh, if, if you wish. So up to that, we can put the sign to plus 1. So, uh, it, so you see here that this OP coefficient is now uh, completely uh, unambiguously fixed by the crossing equation, by imposing the crossing equation at the, at the level of the four-point function. Any questions about that? OK, so um, uh, another consequence of this analysis uh, is that uh, see the, the sigma itself cannot appear in this OPE. So this equals 0. So sig sigma, sigma, sigma is just equal to 0. Um, because there's no, there's no conformal block corresponding to internal weight 1 over 16. Um, uh, so you can, by analyzing you know, analogous crossing questions for other four point functions involving epsilon, uh, it turns out that you can, you can show that C. Um, epsilon epsilon sigma is equal to zero, and so is c epsilon epsilon epsilon. Um, so in fact, and the, the, these uh, uh, sort of constants are supposed to be uh, invariant under permutation of these uh, uh, of the three operators involved. Um, so um, uh, in fact, uh, this this guy here, c sigma sigma epsilon, is the only non-trivial. Uh, three-point function with the only non-trivial structure constant uh, of the uh, 3D icing CFT. Um, and uh, so in that sense, we have actually solved the theory completely, because we said that uh, to determine this 2D CFT, you need to know the list of primaries. You need to know their structure constants. And all the structure constants are, are given by this. Um, but uh, you, know, you, you could wonder, uh, 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 are, are the sigma and epsilon all the operators that's allowed in the theory? Or could you truncate the spectrum? For example, um, if you take the epsilon epsilon OPE, uh, we said that you know, sigma cannot appear here, epsilon itself can also can, cannot appear here, so there's only one 
uh, possible channel, which is the identity channel. Um, and that's indeed correct. Uh, but because epsilon epsilon OP only involves identity and its virtual descendants, uh, you might imagine you actually could have a 2D CFT with only epsilon and without sigma. Because the OP of epsilon was still close on itself and obey associativity. Um, uh, but in fact, if you do that, if you truncate the theory by throwing out sigma and its descendants, only keeping epsilon, um, you will indeed satisfy the associativity of OPE, but you'll violate the modular invariance. Uh, so the modular invariance, the torus one-point function, actually puts um, very non-trivial constraints uh, on top of what we have discussed so far, uh, and will dictate that uh, you must have exactly one sigma and one epsilon. Um, so kind of uh, uh, short in time. Um, so let me, uh, let me just describe uh, uh, in very briefly what happens to the, to the torus one-point function, and we can perhaps discuss uh, this in some more detail tomorrow. Okay, so um, now the torus one point function in the icing CFT. So you have three possible one point functions because you have three possible primaries uh, in the theory. So you have a torus one point function with identity operating insertion. This is the same as having no insertion, just the torus partition function. You have insertion of sigma, you have insertion of epsilon. Now, uh, in the conform block decomposition, you have sigma here. These two operators have to be the same. Uh, you can have one, one, you can have sigma, sigma, epsilon, epsilon. But in all the three cases, this three-point function is uh, zero. So the torus one-point function of sigma is equal to zero. Uh, in fact, that follows from a Z2 symmetry, because uh, you, you see that the, the three-point function coefficients are such that uh, there's a symmetry in flipping sigma to minus sigma. So the, the Z, so there's a um, Z2 symmetry that sends sigma to a minus sigma and epsilon to itself. Um, so that symmetry tells you that this torus one-point function of sigma has to be zero. Um, the torus one-point function of uh, epsilon uh, is uh, involves only one torus conformal, conformal block uh, because uh, this guy here cannot be identity, one, one, and epsilon, that three-point function reduces the one-point function of epsilon on the plane, which is zero. So the only thing that's allowed is to have a sigma in there. Uh, whereas this guy here uh, receives sort of all three. So, so I, I don't have to draw the identity channel. So, so there, 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 there are three possible things that can propagate in this torus. Uh, they are one, sigma, and epsilon. Um, so uh, the torus partition function, z, tau, and tau bar, uh, is a sum of three conformal blocks, in which case, in this case, they are uh, the so-called torus characters. Uh, correspond to weight zero for identity, uh, weight one sixteenth correspond to sigma, and uh, uh, weight one half correspond to tau. Uh, where, uh, in this case, because uh, you don't have to insert any operator in, in the middle, the, these characters uh, admit some simple expression. So chi h of tau is just um, the trace over uh, the space of uh, uh, descendants of uh, this primary of weight h, excluding the null states, uh, q to the L0 minus um, c over 24, and c is 1 half, so this is 1 over 48. So in principle, if you can count the des number of descendants at every level, uh, uh, with the null states removed, you can just write this explicit as a q series uh, expansion in powers of q. Uh, but because the actual structure of null states is a bit complicated, it's uh, not immediately obvious what that Q expansion is. Uh, we'll discuss explicitly what this is next time. Uh, so for now, I will just write this formula since I'm running out of time. And uh, uh, this, in this other case, uh, 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 this one-point function of epsilon on the torus of modulus tau um, is equal to, well, the OP coefficient C uh, uh, sigma sigma epsilon uh, by itself multiply the mod squared 
of some function. Uh, let's call it, uh, I'm calling it f of, little f of tau here. Um, and, and this is the, this is the conformal block, the, the, the conformal block associated with this particular torus one point function with the weight one half outside and the, inter the internal state has, uh, internal primary has weight uh, one sixteenth. Uh, so uh, uh, tomorrow we will um, uh, we'll, we'll determine what these chi h's are and we'll, we'll determine what this f tau uh, is and we'll discuss uh, some other things uh, like symmetries and generalization of symmetries of the uh, to the icing CFT. Okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, generally, yes. I mean, it depends on, uh, but there could also be null states appearing in, in, in level two. Depends on uh, wh which operator you're talking about. Okay, but but that is uh, true. Um, but uh, uh, if, you know, if you want to explicitly write a solution to that different equation, it might be hard. But there are uh, techniques that allow you to deduce this kind of crossing rel relations without having to know the function explicitly themselves. Um, that's uh, that's uh, usually the way to go. Uh, yeah, any other questions? Okay.